1126 what are the reason for appearing uh, for appearing the shock waves in the divergent portion yeah so the question is on what's the reason why a shock wave appears in uh, in the divergent portion of a uh, convergent uh, cd nozzle uh, see what ends up happening is that if you are using a cd nozzle and let us say that you have a fixed upstream stagnation pressure and you keep on reducing the back pressure as you keep on reducing the back pressure more and more flow will start flowing through the nozzle and at some point the throat will choke this is what we have discussed earlier when the throat chokes what what ha what happens is that the the mach number there is going to become exactly equal to 1 and the maximum mass flow rate is going to uh, start flowing through the nozzle now if you decrease the back pressure further than this however if the back pressure is not low enough so that a completely isentropic supersonic flow can develop in the in the um, divergent portion of the nozzle because the nozzle has to now pass that maximum flow rate the only possibility that this can be done is by the formation of a shock so when we talk about the formation of a shock we actually talk about a, a sort of a final steady state situation but the actual reason why a shock occurs during the process of lowering the uh, back pressure is again exactly the same process that i talked about yesterday that you can always imagine a uh, unsteady process that is going on while you are reducing the back pressure and during this unsteady state there are uh, acoustic waves generated which will get merged together at some point in the divergent section to form the shock so to be honest with you it's not that obvious based on the 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 principles that we know uh, that we can formally say that this is the reason why the the shock occurs but at least you can come up with a couple of points saying that once the nozzle chokes that there is that certain maximum mass flow rate that has to be passed furthermore if you keep on reducing the back pressure the the flow cannot remain subsonic anywhere in the in the divergent section but if the back pressure is not sufficiently low to have a completely isentropic sub, uh, supersonic flow in the divergent section the only way the nozzle is going to function is by creation of a shock at some location within the divergent section that's really what i can uh, answer at this point thank you for question what is the difference between isotropic stagnation state and actual stagnation state so uh, yeah, if i if i understood you correctly you are asking what's the difference between an isentropic stagnation state and an actual stagnation state is that what you asked there are some irreversibility what are the irreversibility see my understanding is that the stagnation uh, state is defined only for an isentropic process so that you imagine a state of the flow to be brought to rest in an isentropic flow and you will reach the the values which we are going to call as the stagnation values so in that sense i will say that when you are talking about stagnation values the assumption of a an isentropic process is built in so i am not too sure uh, if i can answer what what is meant by an actual stagnation state when we talk about a stagnation state my understanding is that the assumption of isentropic process is already built in and is always built in thank you the steam is flowing in a cd nozzle a meta stable state is existing can you tell the reasons so if i if i again understood you correctly you are saying that there is a steam flow in the uh, cd nozzle and a meta stable state is existing is that correct what you said meta stable state is existing in the diverging portion uh i am not exactly sure if i if i have heard this terminology that a meta stable state is uh, existing uh, so i don't think i'll be able to answer this question unfortunately let me see if uh, professor bandarkar has any light uh, to to throw on uh, unless he tells what is this meta stable state yeah is it possible for you to explain what you mean by the meta stable state because i haven't heard this terminology i'm sorry yeah i i'm sorry i i am not aware of the term that you used the meta stable state so i was i was wondering if you can explain what you mean by that actually i saw the 
fundamentals of classical thermodynamics by Gordon Van Weyland. Okay. Textbook. Hmm. The textbook I saw the metastable is existing while the steam is flowing in the CD nozzle. A metastable state is existing in the divergent portion. Okay, so I think based on uh, what you are saying, I think uh, roughly I may try to guess what he is trying to say. See, what happens normally is that uh, let us say steam is flowing and um, you have reached the saturation temperature at a particular pressure, you should automatically go to the liquid state. But what happens normally is that sometimes you continue beyond it and you are still in the gaseous form though you are you should have been in the liquid form and that is what is called as a metastable state and a slight disturbance will just throw it into the liquid region and uh, you will go where you ought to be. So, I think this is what um, you are getting in the textbook that sometimes these situations do occur that uh, instead of being in the correct state you are in a state which is still possible, but you know very uh, in very less likely to happen. Thank you. Uh, uh, can I ask the qu questions in uh, entropy? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Sir, uh, if you convert heat into work at low temperatures, the more entropy will be generated. Suppose if you if you convert the same heat at high temperature, less entropy will be generated. What are the reasons why the entropy is increases at low temperatures? So, I am not very sure by what you mean by when heat is uh, at low temperature, low entropy is generated. So, how did you come up with this statement? If you can explain that, then we can go ahead. Actually, I, I saw in the textbook at uh, low temperatures, if you convert heat into work, more entropy will be generated. Suppose if you convert same heat at high temperatures, less entropy will be generated. Okay, so this is what you have read somewhere that at low temperatures, if you convert Q, you will generate high entropy. Is that what you have heard? So, I mean, uh, I am not totally sure why this would be true. Okay, so it does not seem to follow any logic right now, but let me see. If you can tell me which book it is, let me read up the context and I can tell you what this may be about. Okay, so, otherwise I would uh, not be in a position to answer this question. Thank you. One more question, sir. What are the causes to increase the entropy? I mean, one of the most common causes is uh, purely friction. Uh, so, for example, I mean that is the main cause of irreversibility is anywhere. So, for example, you know regularly in a steam turbine or a gas turbine, okay. So, for example, let me draw a gas turbine on a TS diagram, okay. So, you know that you start at some lower pressure P1 and sorry, these lines are not well drawn here. Okay, so, you have now two pressure lines P 1 and P 2 and I know that you know as per the second law, I need to go only either straight up or I go like this. Now, this is assuming no irreversibility and an adiabatic situation and while flowing through the compressor blade, if there is friction or if there is uh, you know detachment of the flow over the blades, you will start increasing the entropy and you will have to start putting more and more work in and that is what is going to cause uh, basically an increase in entropy. So, friction in general is always the by far the main cause for an increase in entropy. Thank you. One more question sir. What is entropy transfer? How it is associated with heat transfer? So, I am not very clear that I have ever heard this term of entropy transfer. Okay, for every uh, system you can define an entropy. 
and for a control volume you can figure out what is the entropy coming in and going out and figure out what is happening, but uh, I am not very sure that I would ever use this term called entropy transfer. Thank you. One more question. What are the negative te thermodynamic temperatures? Uh, so, this again this depends on the context that you are using. As far as we are concerned, okay, uh, we have set some absolute zero somewhere which we cannot reach. And uh, as far as we are concerned, such temperature, I mean, it does not matter to us that such temperatures can exist because we think that the lowest possible is zero. That is about it. Thank you. Can you show the entropy varies logarithmically with disorder number? No, sorry. Actually, I am, I do not think I have. Uh, knowledge about this disorder number at all. So, I would not be able to comment, but probably what you are trying to say is uh, uh, what, is, what is called as uh, the number of states that exist and uh, there is some expression that you all have seen earlier which says S is equal to k ln omega and uh, this is again just a definition and uh, it is a definition which ensures that. Uh, the number of states available, micro states available uh, that corresponds to the entropy idea. So, it was a correspondence that was uh, brought about just by defining it in this fashion. So, unless I go into statistical mechanics and tell you what W means and why I should define S like this, uh, I mean that will be a too long process. So, I would rather leave it at for some other point. Okay. So, I do not did not know that someone used to call this as a disorder number, I would rather not call it in that fashion. Usually, it is just the number of uh, uh, states possible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Over and down. Yeah, 1070 Amrita Bangalore. Uh, actually, I have a question uh, regarding compressible flow. Uh, we have uh, often come across the uh, statement that in a nozzle, uh, enthalpy gets transmitted into velocity. But how exactly that happens? What is the uh, uh, I mean, what exactly happens for the enthalpy being transmitted into velocity? Is it kinetic theory of gases? Uh, yes, so that is uh, that's a very fundamental question that you are asking. So, let me repeat the question that uh, we, we talk about enthalpy getting converted into kinetic energy in, uh, in case of a nozzle and the question is how does, how does this exactly happen. And within the framework of our macroscopic uh, say thermodynamics or fluid mechanics, uh, it is uh, essentially impossible to describe how this is happening. If you want to really know the details of how this conversion is happening, as you correctly pointed out, you have to resort to a molecular uh, level analysis, where typically uh, perhaps uh, what, we, what we feel is that through the molecular collision process, you can try to come up with a good feel of how the enthalpy is getting converted into energy, uh, kinetic energy that is. So, the random thermal energy that perhaps we can represent using the enthalpy will get converted into uh, directed kinetic energy in a uh, convergent divergent type situation through the mechanism of molecular collisions is what I can uh, probably say at this point, but more details are uh, for me it is impossible to right now give unless and until you really study in detail the kinetic theory that, that is correct. So, I would say that that is where I will stop. Uh, would you suggest any book for this if uh, I have to go through? My, as far as my understanding goes, uh, usually in a nozzle type situation where the kind of stuff that we were discussing is hardly ever uh, covered in any of the, the books that I have gone through at the level of uh, molecular um, uh, dynamics let us say. So, to be honest with you, I have not come across any book so far which talks about such processes from a molecular point of view. Uh, my next question, basically uh, another question connected to this, I am not very sure, for example, if you take uh, a gas or an air, if it starts entering a nozzle with Mach number is equal to 1, then what exactly happens? Suppose it is flowing through a convergent nozzle or a divergent nozzle. If it starts from Mach number is equal to 1, starting with uh, the equation. <coughs> dv by v is equal to dA by A divided by m squared minus 1. 
if the entry starts with Mach number 1. In one case it enters through a conversion nozzle, in another case it enters through a diversion nozzle. So what would be the difference? Yeah, so if it so if it if it enters a diversion nozzle at Mach number of 1, it is just like uh, what you have in a standard conversion diversion nozzle at the throat and the flow will go to, to supersonic uh, situation assuming that there is a driving potential uh, that, that supports it. What, what we feel is that in case a Mach number 1 flow enters a conversion nozzle, uh, it must uh, decelerate uh, according to the um, area velocity relation. Here what I am assuming that the, the flow is entering perhaps fraction below Mach number of 1 if, if I can use that uh, assumption, but that is what uh, I would I would answer this question. Yeah, obviously if the Mach number is slightly above than 1 or slightly less than 1 then you can easily describe, but uh, usually that is the question which I come across when I teach this course, uh, if it is Mach number equal to 1, uh, <coughs> is there any explanation, for example in the throat, from the throat. Uh, in the diverging part, the flow becomes supersonic, but starting from Mach number 1, if we use the uh, equation, velocity area equation, we cannot actually show that starting from Mach number 1, and diversion nozzle, uh, nozzle will actually create a supersonic flow. That is correct. I, I understand that, you know, you, utilizing only that equation, it is essentially impossible to come up with that, uh, uh, that conclusion. So, in, in practice the only way I can I can think about is that really if there is only uh, the, the Mach number is little bit above or below, then we can really talk about it using that equation and uh, that is where I will really uh, answer my or answer your question. Yes sir, uh, I have one more question, uh, in fluid mechanics or thermodynamics, I am not very clear about the concept of pressure is it same as force per unit area, then uh, exactly what happens in a boiler or a condenser when we say it is a constant pressure process or uh, through a, for example, if you take incompressible flow, what, exa what exactly happens in a nozzle, can we uh, define using the basic definition of pressure rather than taking uh, uh, the Bernoulli's equation or something like that. Yes, uh, you can definitely define pressure in the same way, it is just that if I put uh, uh, let us say an area where I can measure or you know just a flat plate there that is the pressure it will experience. So, you can keep on moving the flat plate anywhere and if you see the same pressure then the whole system is at the same pressure. So, this is what is happening in a boiler that is uh, in the tube ok this is the uh, uh, this is the force per unit area that the boiler tube will see and this is the force per unit area that. Uh, is there in the boiler drum also. So, it is it is exactly force per unit area that is the standard uh, pressure that it will see. Thank you. Now, actually in, in a boiler there is heat addition, there is a phase change, uh, there is a change in a specific volume, uh, but uh, why exactly the pressure remains constant in a pressure uh, in a boiler or a condenser. Ok, so uh, this is this is up to us whether we want to maintain the pressure constant. So, for example, if you use a simple pressure cooker, you have put the whistle on top of it. So, the pressure keeps increasing up to the point that the whistle will uh, lift and it will exhaust steam so that the pressure inside is maintained. So, this is what is done in a boiler too. The drum is such that slowly you start building up the pressure because you convert water into steam and the steam will want to now occupy that space, but you are converting more water into steam and slowly the pressure will build up. So, it is a huge pressure cooker and uh, you have to now decide where at what point this is safe. So, there is a big vent out there and let us say you have decided that the pressure it should take is 160 bar, then you will safely design it for let us say 300 bar, but if it goes above 160 bar, there is a vent which will just let off the steam and ensure that the pressure is within a range. So, it is hardly ever 160 bar, but it will be plus minus a few 5 bars because you will be continuously venting if there is such a process, but this is how you maintain it, you know you see some gauge you ensure this is the pressure, if it is more then you know it is dangerous, you start venting off. So, that is what you do there, thank you. But in uh, suppose if we take the condenser of a refrigerator, we do not have any controlling things like this, but still we consider it as a constant pressure process. No, no, in a, in a, in a condenser too you are actually doing it, because you are constantly ejecting things out. So, if you start the condenser, you actually need to 
suck out everything using pumps and then only you start the condenser and once you start condensing the gas immediately the sorry the steam the steam condenses to water and there is vacuum and you are ensuring by continuously sucking out that the pressure is maintained and it's always pretty dangerous the condenser is by far the place where you will get the worst contaminants because any small leakage and the outside atmospheric air will try to come in and if it mixes with the steam you have a pretty deep problem. So, you always have to ensure that the condenser is very very leak tight and uh, ensure that the pressure is maintained constant in the condenser. Otherwise, the pressure in the condenser if you do not design a good condenser unfortunately, your condenser pressure will reach 1 bar and you will have an inefficient uh, steam turbine. Thank you. I have uh, last one question. Uh, in thermodynamics, why uh, specific heated constant pressure is always greater than specific heated constant volume? Uh, no, this is just how we have defined it. You know, we have defined something called Cp and we are calling it as dH by dt and H is just uh, u plus Pv. So, if you look at our present definitions, this is how we have defined it so that uh, Cp is always defined in terms of Cv plus R. Whereas, if you wanted to look at uh, the previous definitions which were not in terms of these enthalpy and internal energy, then you could have easily explained that uh, to maintain constant pressure you wanted to do some work okay, and the heat is going not only in uh, whatever heat you are adding is not only going to increase your internal energy, but it is also doing the work that is necessary to maintain the constant pressure. Whereas, if you are not let, let us say the, the system expand then all it would have done was increase the internal energy and hence you would require lesser amount of energy. That is how the previous people would look at it and that is it is okay to look at it in the same fashion, there is no problem. Thank you. So, C p minus C v is always going to be R for that fluid and C p minus C v in molar terms is always going to be universal gas constant. So, it is the same, you are pretty correct on that. If you consider on a molar basis, it will always be R, universal gas constant. So, that is always going to be true. Thank you. One to one nine prestige institute, go ahead. Sir, uh, good evening. I am Srikant Tare from prestige institute of engineering and science along with my uh, colleagues. Uh, Dr. Parip Bangavani, my director. My question is on combustion. If I got number of gases mixture like LPG, which is the combination of hello, which is the combination of uh, yeah, propane and butane. In that case, without actual combustion, I want to know the calorific value of this mixture. How can I calculate it? Yes, sure. See, as long as you know the proportion of uh, the gases. So, let us say you have 60 percent uh, butane and uh, remaining 40 percent as propane. So, what you do is you say that I have 100 moles of the gas and I say 60 moles of butane C 4 H 8 will react with oxygen and nitrogen. I find out how much energy is released for 40 moles of C 3 sorry this is uh, butane is C 4 H 10, propane is C 3 H 8. I will react with regular air find out how much energy is released. So, I will see that for 100 moles of LPG this is the amount of energy released then I can either calculate it on a per mole basis of LPG or a per kilogram basis of LPG. So, there is as long as you know the composition you can do it is all pretty much direct proportion. So, I do not see any harm in uh, you know going ahead with the calculation. Thank you. So, uh, by, by simply mathematical calculation you said that it will be possible for me to know about the calorific values. Correct, yes exactly. You just do a direct proportion and you should get your calorific value. Uh, thank you, over and out. 1047 SDM College. Uh, sir, uh, my question is uh, why the air fuel ratio is always considered uh, on mass basis and not on volumetric analysis? Uh, I think it is just a matter of convenience. Both in gravimetric analysis and volumetric analysis, it is taken on mass basis, not on volume basis. Why? 
yeah see if you express it is just a matter of convenience you realize that if you uh, for most hydrocarbons if you uh, express it in terms of uh, volumetric basis then you realize that as you go for higher and higher alkanes uh, you will require more and more oxygen and nitrogen and more moles so on a molar basis you would have far more moles as the alkane uh, size increases whereas um, uh, what you really want to do is find out what is uh, the actual amount needed for combustion and it's you need a convenient number for that and it's far more convenient just to go for the mass basis because you know roughly where the range should be and that is where uh, you are going to be comfortable with. Thank you. Sir, can we define the equivalence ratio on volume, volume basis? Is it possible, sir? Uh, are you saying you want to define the equivalence ratio on a volumetric basis? It is up to you. I mean, it depends on whether other people want to use the same thing, but you can please go ahead with it, no problem. Sir, one more question, sir. The composition of air is always taken as the mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. Why, sir? With those are some, to some extent, some other gases are also present. But for all calculation present, we take only uh, oxygen and nitrogen. Why is it, why it yeah, is so, I sir? mean, I would say the, the simple answer is that we are engineers. We do not want to get down to real minute details which do not affect us. Okay, so, 79 and 21 we take, we can get all our calculations. We are not really, you know, trying to figure out how much argon or carbon dioxide there is, how is go, it is going to affect. Because those are in some less than 1 percent uh, population out there. And we think if this is not going to affect so much, why bother or put so much effort into it? And you will realize that in most engineering calculations, a reasonably good approximations, we can design something pretty well. And I, this, this is my only simple answer for it. Thank you. Uh, sir, one more question, sir. The polynomial fit that you explained on uh, CV, that is specific heat at constant uh, volume that is developed, uh, is it this, can we develop? the same expression for CP, for CP being the? Yes, for sure, because uh, actually the expression is always calculated for CV rather than CP. Okay, so see, actually it is the expression for CV which is calculated and that is because CV is directly defined as du by dt and du by dt is very uh, readily obtained and uh, we find that for monoatomic gases, CV will start with 2.5 R and uh, as you go to diatomic gases, you can go to higher uh, uh, CV, sorry, uh, you go start with 1.5 R and as you go higher, you can get higher and higher CVs and then finally, CP is just defined as CV plus R because that is a straightforward relationship. So, actually the calculation is always of CV first and CP is just defined as CV plus R. Thank you. So, one more last question, sir. Uh, so, what is the exact relation between the enthalpy and internal energy of combustion? So, I am not sure what you want to say, uh, what do you want to mean by internal energy of combustion. I mean enthalpy is very straightforward defined H is equal to U plus P V. So, that is the strict definition for enthalpy. So, if I want delta H is delta U plus P D V plus V D P. Okay, and most of the combustion is always done at constant pressure. So, we do not look at this. So, there is always a PDV work built in. So, rather than looking at internal energy, we just go for enthalpy because it is of convenience. Again, it is purely a matter of convenience that we list enthalpy rather than internal energy. That is because we know or we all our reactions are such that we are trying to maintain a constant pressure somewhere and it is uh, more convenient to work in enthalpy terms rather than anything else. Thank you. 1195 Bansal College, please uh, go ahead. Hello, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, my question regarding convergent divergent nozzle. In convergent divergent nozzle, when we are going in the direction of flow, we have seen that pressure velocity, pressure temperature decreases while Mach number and velocity increases. Why it is it is so happened? So, uh, the question is on CD nozzle and uh, what is being pointed is that as you go along the flow direction, 
the pressure and temperature is going to decrease whereas, the velocity and uh, uh, the Mach number are going to increase and the question is why, why does this happen. So, the, the answer is if, if you want to look at it from a purely microscopic point of view, you can simply go and use our uh, mass balance and the momentum equations which we put together and we came up with that area velocity relation using which you can figure out that for example, if you are dealing with a subsonic flow situation as the area will decrease you will see that the velocity is going to increase and if you are dealing with a uh, supersonic situation you will see that as the area decreases the velocity also in, uh, decreases. And using this going back to the momentum equation you can figure out that as the velocity is uh, behaving accordingly the, the pressure is going to behave and uh, you will see that as the velocity decreases for example, you will see that the pressure will uh, uh, sorry as the velocity increases the pressure will decrease. Because we are dealing with an isentropic flow situation the pressure and temperature are related through the isentropic law and hence the temperature will also uh, decrease. So, just using the conservation equations of mass balance and the momentum equation uh, which we combine to form that uh, area velocity relation you can actually work out the entire uh, mechanism as to what is happening here. So, this is from the framework of a continuum uh, fluid mechanics and thermodynamics. If you want to know more fundamentally one has to resort to a molecular level description which, uh, which is totally out of the scope of this present discussion and I will not be able to discuss that here. Thank you. Sir, we have seen the convergent portion and divergent portion. Divergent portion always uh, longer than longer to convergent portion. Uh, does it any effect on the uh, you know uh, supersonic region when we are uh, since divergent portion is longer than convergent portion what happened in, if you are reducing the divergent portion in the similar fashion as it is convergent. See actually the reason typically the divergent portion is kept longer is uh, so that the, the angle of divergence is kept to a fairly small value in order to avoid uh, phenomena such as uh, uh, separation of, uh, of the flow. So, if you want to maintain the, the flow attached to the uh, to the walls and you do not want to get into uh, uh, undesirable phenomena like the separation of flow, you would like to maintain the divergent angle small and if you want to maintain the divergent angle small the only way to, to achieve a certain area ratio is by increasing the divergent length section. So, that is the reason I think uh, you will see that typically the divergent length is, uh, is long. Sir, is there any role of density? Is there any role of density with this sonic, subsonic and supersonic flow? Yeah, so the, the, the change in the density is built into the uh, into the entire process through the conservation of mass statement. If you go back to our slides you will see that for this quasi one dimensional flows uh, you will see that the mass conservation statement was for finally, written as 0 over rho plus d v over v plus d a over a equal to 0. So, indeed the, uh, the, the density is changing from location to location and uh, in fact, all variables the density, the pressure, the temperature and the velocity and obviously, the Mach number else also are all changing and they are all coupled to each other in, in this compressible flow situation. So, I will say yes that the density is playing a role and the, the biggest effect of that you can see through the mass conservation statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 1079 Gita Institute please go ahead if you have a question. If the alpha is the nozzle angle for a multi stage uh, steam turbine then what is the maximum efficiency for that? Uh, actually, at this point I would be unable to answer it and it could not depend only on alpha, it would depend on many other factors. Okay. You need steam to enter smoothly and then even you know stick to the uh, passage and go out. So, it cannot depend only on alpha, but uh, there are many kinds of empirical relations which will tell you how the efficiency can be related to alpha plus the camber angle and so on. But at this point I do not really have the adequate knowledge to answer that question. Thank you. The entropy of the universe is always going to increase. Can you tell me a point in the atmosphere at which the entropy is constant according to the layer of the atmosphere? So, 
I am not sure whether you know anything can be said like this, because everywhere the state of the system is constantly changing. So, if you can actually go ahead and find out some place where the state of the system is not changing for a long time, then you can say all its properties are the same including the entropy. Whereas, you know steady state for a long time is really a pretty much difficult thing, but let us say you can observe certain points where the state is not changing, maybe you can see such thing, but I am not very sure that you can actually pinpoint somewhere and say the entropy here never changes or the energy here never changes or something like that. Thank you. Okay, sir, it may be possible, I think. Yeah, I mean anything is possible, but I do not <laughs> think you know you can actually go ahead and pinpoint such situations. I mean maybe you can go in the universe at some point where no one exists and say the entropy and energy here will never change, but suddenly some particle may come there and change everything. So, nothing is steady state for a long time. So, I do not think there is going to be any such point ever for a very, very long time, but for a reasonable period of time maybe you can always uh, you know search for such points that is all I can say. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have read in our books that entropy is uh, always going to increase. Yes, so what do you want to say? Means there is a point in that universe, means we have to search that point, I think. No, so I, I am not very clear what do you want to say, uh, which what are you talking of? Are you, you want some point where the entropy never changes? Yes sir, I want that point in the atmosphere. So, I am not sure whether you know you can go ahead and search for such a point. So, that is what I said that you know I am not sure whether you can do it. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, there are no more uh, questions. So, we are closing the session again and tomorrow Professor Gayatunde will come back. Thank you.